Welcome to the Friends of Dan Music Podcast. I'm Dan Miles. Seems like we're about due for another one of our crowd-pleasing Beatles episodes. Uh, today we're going to be speaking about the classic Beatles double album from 1968, which was re-released this year in very deluxe fashion in honor of its 50th birthday. My guest today, Scott Erickson, is a good friend of the show and a longtime fan of the Fab, so he seemed like an excellent fit for this topic. Joining me on the Skype from Danville, Pennsylvania, is Scott Erickson. Welcome. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It seems like I should be the one who lives in Danville. Okay. Well, let's dig into this. Uh, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is the experience of anticipating and receiving this set. I mean, we're talking about a new Beatle product. Um, you know, that seems to be more of a sort of rarefied thing these days. You know, people don't get a physical product. Very often they download things. And, you know, this is an experience getting this. I mean, how was it for you? I had a download of it find its way to me uh, uh, the week of release because I had ordered mine from Amazon UK, so I had to wait for it to be shipped over from Europe. Mm. Um, but the anticipation, I mean, I got, I got to see the package and hold it in my hand and look through, and look through the book before my copy got in the mail because I was, I was at an event, which we'll get to later, where I got to, I got to see an unboxing, a, a live unboxing of the thing. And, yeah. and it's, it, it's, it's, it's really a beautiful set. I mean, everybody complains, and, and, and with reason, you know, people complain about a lot of the, the, re, the rehashes and reissues uh, over the years. But this set is really, really special. They, Apple really did a nice job on it. Yeah, I agree. And, and one thing I kind of forgotten about is back in the day when you got the vinyl in the 60s, you had a unique number, like a serial number pressed on it. And it's the same. So, you know, I, mine is 0011019. So nobody else got... Beatles box set zero zero one one zero one nine, but me. It's actually kind of cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the, well, the original the original uh, release of the album was a was a numbered copy. The first pressings. Um, matter of fact, in the in the book, you see a picture of Paul McCartney's personal copy. He had number three. <laughs> From what I understand, Ringo had number one, and probably obviously John and George had two and four. Just not sure who's who. Well, I'm gonna uh, guess. It, it sounds to me like the oldest guy got number one. That'd be Ringo. Second oldest guy, number two, that's John. Third guy in age was Paul. And once again, the baby brother in fourth place, George. That would make sense. Incidentally, my, my copy is number 99,322. I love the fact that both of ours have the number nine in them. Yes. <laughs> I, I felt really happy about that. But before we talk about how the uh, set is constructed... One thing I want to mention, this is probably an unfair criticism, um, and it's probably not avoidable, but do you feel that the Anthology 3, through no fault of its own, kind of stole a little bit of thunder from this? Because back in 1996, Anthology 3 had 27 tracks and an hour and 14 minutes of music that was related to the White Album. I mean, imagine hearing this new set having not heard Anthology 3 or any bootlegs or anything. Um, there are still some revelations included, but... I can't really complain because back in the 90s, I loved getting Anthology 3, but I'm just saying, could you see my point? Like if we got this in 2018 and you hadn't heard Anthology 3, imagine. Well, you know, it. I didn't really think about it, and but a lot of the, some of the stuff that we've, we've got on Anthology 3 was stuff that was kind of, it was kind of botched. Um, Jeff Emmerich had done some edits and remixes of, of tracks like that that version of Obla Dio Obla Da and Not Guilty for a Beatles album that ultimately never got released called Sessions. Yeah. And instead of going back and remixing things or doing them properly for Anthology 3, they just used those Jeff Emmerich edits and mixes. Yeah. So the box set, yeah, while there was there was some some old white album stuff on Anthology 3 Everything on on this box set was new to yeah. me. Even the the Easter demos that were included on Anthology Three, because these were these were brand new brand new remixes from the from the four track tapes. Right, and this I will say, they were definitely conscious of the Anthology Three material, because even in situations where it appears to be redundant, it's really not. There are subtle differences, so they made sure that they didn't give anybody the exact same thing again. Sometimes I'm listening and I'm thinking, yeah, I got this on the way to minute. I don't remember that part. So, mm -hmm. you know, so that's cool. Um, let me quickly tell everybody how this breaks down. And 
It's a six disc set in the sense that the first two discs are just straight remixes of the four sides of the album. On disc one, you have side one and two. On disc two, you have side three and four. The third disc are the Isher demos that uh, Scott just mentioned that were recorded at George Harrison's house. And then the, the remaining three discs are studio outtakes, alternate versions, etc. cetera. Um, there is also a 5.1 mix on a Blu-ray disc. Um, you know, what I did was I just hit play without looking at the track listing for all six discs. I had heard some podcasts, and so I knew a little bit about what was on it, but you know, I just went play, and what am I going to get? And that was, that was kind of fun, too. Just like getting it in the mail and opening it up, and, you know, I, I'm, what I'm saying is back in the day, that's how you experienced everything. There was no other way to do it. You know, you right. got like a, an album, a, a big, you know, 12 by 12, whatever the size was, an album cover, and liner notes, and you put the vinyl on, there's a sense of excitement. Um, I felt like I got a little bit of that again, and not only that, but it was a Beatle thing, because, you know, I was born in 63, so when I was uh, seven or eight years old is when they officially disbanded, and so I learned a lot of it in retrospect. So, you know, hearkening back to Anthology, when they put out Free as a Bird and all that, it was a rare opportunity for me to, you know, experience a new Beatles thing. And this wasn't just like one sort of, you know, three little song. This is like a massive uh, deal. So... I appreciate that. I did not go for the Sgt. Pepper set. Um, did you? Oh, of course I did. Yeah. Oh, I'm not surprised. We can do a whole other show on that. The Pepper set had to happen in order for this White Album set to happen. True. Had the, the Pepper box not been successful, this White Album set probably would not have happened. And uh, what I'm hoping is next year you and I can get together and talk about the Abbey Road box set. I'm hearing rumors, but I've also heard not, I've not, I've not heard anything definite mm-hmm. announced about it yet. It yeah. would make sense. This this one's doing very well. As a matter of fact, it's in the top 100 on the Billboard charts this this week for Christmas sales and everything. So the reason I think it's likely is because I think traditionally it's been the best seller in the catalog. You know, with the uh, post Beatle era, with you know new teens and twenty somethings coming along, Abbey Road is always. You know, it's sort of like a dark side of the moon, Eagles greatest hits kind of thing. It's always selling a lot. And one other thing I do want to mention is, along with all this music, this set also included reproductions of the original poster you got when you bought the album, um, band photos, the comprehensive book we mentioned. So it does warrant the price tag, which is in excess of $100, but, you know, you get a lot. But one aspect I want to address, like right at the top here is, you know, technically, there is no white album. Um... Everybody calls this thing the White Album, uh, but they called it The Beatles. The artist name is The Beatles. The album name is The Beatles. So I hate to say it, but on a certain level, that was a poor choice. If you name something a title and no one ever uses that title, uh, I think, you know, this deep into your recording career, you start recording in 1962, six years later, after having several products out, you go for a self-titled thing. Uh, I understand the thinking was, you know, Sgt. Pepper had an elaborate album cover in a fancy name let's do a simple name and a simple album cover but you know everybody identifies it even um you know sources official sources that call it the beatles they'll point in parentheses after it you know quote unquote the white album right was it a poor choice the quote that everybody uses when whenever there's a criticism of the album they quote mccartney in that that interview clip from anthology and it's it's i think that quote is a pet peeve of mine i'm sick of hearing it but you know what? It works. It was the Beatles. It was the White Album. It sold. Shut up. Yeah, it's true. I'm, I'm just saying is that they were the first on so many things. And this is another thing they were the first on, which was, you know, when they titled an album Rubber Soul, everybody calls it Rubber Soul. They call it Revolver. Everybody calls it Revolver. It's true of everything they did, except this one. I'm just saying is that I felt the need to point out that everybody calls it casually, you know, informally, unofficially, the White Album. But if somebody asks you, hey, what's your favorite Beatles album? And you go... The Beatles. You know, to most people, you sound like it, the Beatles. There's no album, The Beatles. No, what's your favorite? It's like almost a who's on first routine. Yeah, I can see that. But even, I think, even from, like, originally released, people just started calling it The White Album. We're going to call it The White Album for the rest of this. I've always called it The White Album. Everybody does. I just thought I probably ought to mention it officially. I mean, I'm even calling this podcast The White Album at 50. I'm not calling it The Beatles at 50, because there again, it's... It just seems, you know, like when Led Zeppelin made their first album, they called it Led Zeppelin. I think Van Halen did the same thing. On your first album, maybe so, but you know, this deep in to their recording career was a odd choice. But more significant than that is I read the book cover to cover, and this is 
sort of presented as the Beatles' follow-up to Pepper. I had always thought a magical mystery tour as the follow-up to Pepper, but I guess it's true that that's not really a full album. There's really only a handful of new tunes. There was Fool on the Hill, Mother Should Know from Paul. There was I'm the Walrus from John. And the magical mystery tour title track, Blue Jay Way from George, and then this thing flying. So, so really five vocal tunes and one instrumental. Six tunes doesn't really constitute an album. Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, All You Need Is Love, Hello, Goodbye, Baby, You're a Rich Man. That was all cobbled together from singles and stuff. Um, right, but keep in mind, in 1967, when Magical Mystery Tour came out, it wasn't released as an album, it was released as an EP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what I'm saying is I kind of agree that this is the follow-up to Sgt. Pepper. My point is I had never thought of it that way before. I was like, all right, Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour, White Album. So it's important to keep that in mind, too, as we sort of go through this, because in their minds, when they are coming up with a white album cover as a contrast to the previous one, I think in their minds, this is their follow-up to Sgt. Pepper, because they're in one other difference, of course, it's a double album instead of a single album. Right. Um, so I thought what we would do is, um, instead of going track by track through the album from start to finish, it might be kind of interesting to look at this album through the eyes of each of the four band members, starting with Ringo. Um, you know, when I think of Ringo and the White Album, there is a tremendous variety of genres on this thing. I mean, almost any genre you can think of. And, right. one, and ones you haven't thought of are on here. He's not the only drummer on here, as we'll discuss, but he's a drummer on the majority of it, and he's a very talented uh, percussionist and drummer. And, you know, as we go through the different tunes, there's a couple points where I was particularly impressed with what he did that I'll point out. Um, but for Ringo personally, this was a big moment for him, the White Album, because... It was the first time he had a solo songwriting credit on a Beatles album. He'd had some co-writes, and always credited as Richard Starkey. What Goes On, um, later on the Let It Be album, he had a credit for Dig It. And that instrumental flying, they just credited all four of them. Uh, it was just a jam. So Don't Pass Me By, this is, you know, it's a big moment for him. And as he said in Anthology, he was happy that they didn't just go like, oh, we'll give this five minutes and then get back to, you know, the good stuff. He felt like the band really took it seriously and really worked on it. And before we get into my feelings and comments about Don't Pass Me By, let's get yours. Well, it, you know, you, you think about it. It took Ringo, you know, six almost six years to get a song on like get one of his songs on an album. He started writing that song in 63. Uh, and apparently every time he'd try to write something, he'd end up rewriting somebody else's melody. Right. You know, and Paul would call him on it or or, or, or George or, or somebody would call him on it. But yeah, uh, uh, Don't Pass Me By, it's, it's a fun song to play live. About 10, 11 years ago, I was part of a, a, a project with uh, with the late Pat Denizio, and we did the entire White Album live. Wow. This was 19, this is 2009 we did it, so, you know, almost 11, 10, 11 years. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I had fun playing that song live. I don't think of it as a, as a, a great song. I don't know if, the, if I like the violin or not. Right. I like the mono mix because it was sped up and over with quicker. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's it's not a bad song, and 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 yeah, you can hear that that the other guys are 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 into it and giving it their all. Yeah, for Ringo to get his own solitary writing credit is great, you know. And thankfully, it's one of the few songs that Michael Jackson wasn't able to acquire. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Um, of course, John and Paul had written a lot of songs for Ringo. Um, you know, probably best known would be Yellow Submarine and uh, with a little help from my friends. Do you have a favorite Ringo vocal performance prior to the White Album? Prior to the White Album? As stupid a song as it is, I, I dig what goes on. Okay. And I, and I like Act Naturally. I like those. Yeah. Um, a couple things. Uh, you know, Scott mentioned the, the country fiddler. Um, I think Ringo had originally sort of conceived this as a country western thing, and that's why that happened. Um, surprisingly, Paul is the drummer on Don't Pass Me By, not Ringo. Um, probably so Ringo could concentrate on his vocals. Um, you know, uh, one thing that's really odd about this, and I don't know whose idea it was, there was an elaborate 26-piece orchestra instrumental prelude that was originally intended to lead into this pretty simple song, pretty basic song. There's nothing wrong with simplicity and being basic. I think one of the things the song suffered from was the genius work that was surrounding it. <laughs> You know, but this um, this piece, which was retitled A Beginning, did show up on Anthology. I don't know too many people who would say, yeah, don't pass me by. That's one of my favorites. But I will say that not long ago, uh, Ringo did a more sort of relaxed reimagining of it, 
which I much prefer, which I greatly prefer. Sort of like a, a chilled out version of it that uh, doesn't have the sort of oompa energetic feel. And, um, you know, the, the lyrics are simple, but they need to be because the music's simple. And, right. And, and congratulations to him for having a songwriting credit on a Beatles album because if nothing else, it's freaking bank, you know. <laughs> I'm talking about the Beatles here. Um, Absolutely. Even if he wasn't performing on it, just having the writing credit on that, he could have retired on. Um, one last thing I want to say about Don't Pass Me By. This is one of the nice things about having the book. In the book, there are reproductions, or I guess not even reproductions, like photographs of handwritten lyrics from all of them. Uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. I would say John has the worst handwriting of the group. Um, George's are great because he often just crosses out a word and writes a new choice in, and you can see what the original one was. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but they had, and very often it's on, you know, receipts or bills or, you know, hotel stationery and, you know, just scribbled. And, and considering how classic all this stuff is in our mind, you know, I don't know about you, I know you're a writer and I'm a writer. You know, my lyrics are on a, a word processor, which has now become, you know, you know, word files on computers. And then, the, you know, they would just grab a, a pad and write down the lyrics to something that would just be epic and legendary in our mind. And it's just like scribbled on a pad. Um... But there, there appear to be some alternate lyrics for Don't Pass Me By. It, it's on the same page, and it fits the rhythm. So if that's the case, let me read what this is. I, I might even try to sing it, but <laughs> people remember the melody. It goes, I feel a little foolish sitting here alone. Instead of eating crackers, I think I'll just get stoned. You came all wrapped in cellophane with purple bursting free. The card said, open carefully and pay for COD. <laughs> I, I like those lyrics way better than what's in there. I wish I would have put that in the song. I don't know. I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> it doesn't make it a better song, but it makes the lyrics more interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, we need to move to Ringo's other lead vocal, which was a Lennon and McCartney. We'll speak more about the song itself when we get to John, but this is the album closer for the whole kit and caboodle, for all 30 songs in the White Album, Good Night. And this did have one of those revelations that wasn't on the anthology series, and I'll let you explain that to the listeners. Oh, uh, I, first of all, let me let me just say, my first experience listening to the White Album, I'm ashamed to admit, was 1987, 88, when it came out on CD for the first time. And to this day, I have not ever actually listened to the White Album on vinyl. Hmm. I have never actually had the pleasure of dropping the needle on side one, flipping over to side two, then put it. I've never, I've, I've only ever had the CDs mm -hmm. and disc one always got more play than disc two. Yeah. Good night is probably was probably one of my least favorite songs on the album. And then I heard this outtake on the new box set. There is an outtake of good night and early take where John is doing his, he's doing the Travis picking style guitar that Donovan taught him while they were studying with the Maharishi and Ringo is singing the lead vocal. But what absolutely floored me was hearing Paul, John and George standing around another microphone harmonizing like it was 1963. It was very, this boy. Yeah, exactly. And I remember listening to this for the first time at this at, at this this event that we're going to talk about and thinking, who the hell was responsible for scrapping this idea and replacing it with this schmaltzy orchestra? Because this version of the song with this four part harmony and it was amazing. Yeah, it's one of the highlights uh, for sure. And one of the revelations and. You know, what I like about it is it's like the whole band is telling you good night. It's like all four Beatles are saying, thanks for listening to our album. Good night. Instead of just Ringo in the sort of Walt Disney presentation, like it's from Peter Pan or Mary Poppins. And, I just I just got a visual image in my mind as the as the, the song is finally fading out. I just see Tinkerbell flying up and <laughs> dotting the top of the Walt Disney castle with her with her wand. <laughs> Yeah, well, as I said, uh, we're going to talk about that song a little bit more because John is the writer of it. But, um, you know, Paul complained when Phil Spector put choirs and strings on Long and Winding Road, yet he signed off on this. So 
There is definitely well, some funky choir stuff happening in that uh, production. Well, well, Paul likes Paul likes choirs and strings when it's his idea. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Um, just to finish up with Ringo, I, I think that's one of my favorite vocal performances, just strictly in terms of singing, because it's a song about you know saying goodnight to your kids. Ringo was a parent, and he has a real friendly quality to his voice, um, you know. And uh, just in terms of his sheer setting aside the song or anything else, you know, for just singing the song, I think it shows he could carry a tune. And I, oh, he totally I, he totally sells it. Yeah. As much as I like or dislike the song itself, nobody else could have sung it. Yeah, he was the best choice for it. Two other Ringo vocal things I think of on the White Album. Uh, similar to uh, Carry That Weight, where everybody sang, but he was sort of the boy, you got to carry. He was sort of pushed up in the mix. Same, right. same thing with Bungalow Bill. The, hey, Bungalow Bill. He sounds a little louder than everybody else. I don't know if he just sang louder or if they pushed him up, but where he really deserves his credit is this. I got blisters on my fingers! That's the Ringo moment for me. <laughs> only originally heard in the U.S. Uh, well, it was only heard in the U.S. on the stereo mix. It was only heard in the stereo mix, period. That's right. This <laughs> and, was the last time and, the Beatles ever mixed in mono was the White Album. They did two mixes. Everything after that was only stereo. And the mono mix did not fade back in like the stereo one does. Right. And the mono mix was only available in England and I think it might have been in Japan. It was never released. Well, the mono mix was never released in the States anyway. Well, one last thing on Ringo before we move on to George. You had said that uh, What Goes On was probably your favorite Ringo vocal for me, even though it's kind of an obvious one, uh, with a little help from my friends, mainly just because I like the song and I like the way John and Paul are singing too, you know, and they're sort of answering each other. And um, and also I heard Sgt. Pepper when I was four or five years old, so there's a sentimental aspect too. Um, but because this is a double album, he had two songs. Let's move over to Mr. George Harrison who had four songs on the album and also a few other tunes that were floating around at the time uh, as the Isher demos will demonstrate. But on side one of the album, his representation was While My Guitar Gently Weeps. And uh, back on the anthology and also in the Cirque du Soleil show, we had the revelation that it started out in this very soft form before it became a little bit more rollicking and you got Eric Clapton thrown in there. So uh, before we get to my thoughts on that, how's While My Guitar Gently Weeps for you? It is one of my all-time favorite songs by anybody ever, period. <laughs> and to hear the song go through so many permutations from the original the original demo, which is a little more up-tempo, mm -hmm. to the slower version, uh, take one, which, orig which again, originally released on Anthology 3 as prepared for the Sessions album. They used that version for the, the Cirque du Soleil Love show, and one of the last things George Martin did, writing-wise, he wrote a beautiful score for that. And also there's an organ part, which I think Paul is playing on that, on that early take. And then, and then to hear him go, nah, let's, 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 let's turn it into a, a real power tune and, and bring in Eric. And then, of course, the jams that were going on in the studio with another revelation from the While My Guitar Gently Weep sessions, just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And uh, it should be mentioned that they had been going to Trident when they wanted to do 8-track stuff. This is the first time the band had used an 8-track machine at EMI. Right. They had, I think, two 8-track machines sitting in the hallway, but they, they hadn't been, been set up. And it wasn't until, I think, midway through the sessions for this album that Abbey Road finally got around us to getting those together. True. And I agree with you. It's interesting to hear it go from this sort of soft meditation into this sort of rocking band song. Paul must have liked the song because he put a lot of work into his harmony vocal, his organ playing, his piano playing. Um, according to the book, um, the, the playback on this song was slower than the recording. So it does have a, I don't mean this in a negative way, but it does have a sort of draggy, pondering quality to it that I was wondered about, which makes me think they probably did play it faster and slowed it down just a little bit. Um, that would make sense. Um, the Beatles did this all the time on purpose. Rain, perfect example. You know, they wanted to play it faster, so they knew when they slowed it to the tempo they wanted, it would have a sort of unusual quality to it. Um, just touching on the lyrics, though, I mean, whenever I heard this, I look at you all, I'll see the love that is sleeping, I always thought it was, you know, sort of a lament for the unrealized potential of all humanity. And then, whether it's right or wrong, someone else had this theory that maybe George was singing to the other three band members. Probably because of the rumors of acrimony. Oh, he's, to he's totally, totally 
singing to John and Paul. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there were no rumors of acrimony. There was acrimony. Mm -hmm. You know, how could there not be acrimony when Ringo quits the band in the middle of the sessions? And also, there's 30 songs and George gets four. You know, when he's writing songs as good as While My Guitar Gently Weeps, they're still only giving him one per side. Well, Not Guilty was about him. That I mean, that one you could tell that's to the band members. Absolutely, yeah. But I will say, though, and it's kind of nice that you can listen to it with both thoughts in mind. Because um, Within You, Without You uh, is very cosmic and all-encompassing. It's about all of humanity. So he was capable of thinking and writing from that point of view. And also, apparently, George is the one who wrote the line, Ah, oh, look at all the lonely people um, in Eleanor Rigby, the, you know, the melody and the lyrics for that section. It should have been a Lennon McCartney Harrison, if that's true, in my opinion, because that's a hook. But, you know, so I like the fact that for all those years I heard it as George talking to all people, and all of a sudden it's like, nah, it's a John and Paul thing. And it's cool that, that it works both ways. It's similar uh, to Don't Let Me Down. You know, you first hear it, you think John's singing to Yoko. Yoko, you're my new girlfriend, don't let me down. And then you go, no, that part's tight. He's singing to the band members, you don't let me down. So it, there again, it works both ways. <laughs> I, at that point, I have no idea who or what John was singing to. He might have just been singing to uh, his drug dealer. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But, Drugs, please don't let me down. Please don't wear off. <laughs> I, I can't face this stuff anymore. I need a fix as I'm going down. One thing that's cool about the book, I mentioned earlier about handwritten lyrics. There are now, we've heard some uh, verses that, that were cut. And one particular verse that was in the earlier versions that didn't make it into the one that made it on the White Album. Um, George had written down, because you can see his handwritten notes in this book, he'd written down, I look at the sky and I notice it's clouding. And then he crossed out sky and clouding and he put, I look at the world and I notice it's turning. So mm -hmm. he didn't write the whole sentence again, just the two words. And then he rhymed it with, I'm wondering why your cigars keep on burning. And then he crossed that out and put, with every mistake we must surely be learning. So that's what's so cool about, you know, Everybody knows I look at the world and I notice it's turning. With every mistake, we must surely be learning. It started out as I look at the sky and I notice it's clouding. And then even before the learning, it was cigars burning. So, you know, there again, you and I are writers, and usually people don't see these other permutations. My favorite couplet of lyrics from that song are in the demo. And I recently did a performance of Esher demos where I actually learned the Esher demo versions of the songs. Cool. So it was, it was relearning songs I'd been playing for years and I almost lost it. I almost, I almost broke down. I could feel my eyes starting to tear up mm. at the verse. I look at the pain and the hate that is raging while my guitar gently weeps while I'm sitting here doing nothing but aging. Yeah. And he wrote this in early 68. Yeah, he was a kid. And, and here we are 50 years later, and that line, that lyric is more appropriate than it's ever been. Yeah, true. This is what I mean. Within You, Without You was very philosophical about life and death for a guy in his early 20s. And the, the Revolver album was just littered with death references. And these are like successful, happy, healthy guys in their 20s. That's one reason yeah. the Beatles are so fascinating to this day. I thought you were going to talk about the line about, I watch from the wings at the play you are staging, another cool one. Yeah, that, I love that too. But again, for me, it's that um, I, yeah. I, look at the, I look at the trouble and hate that is raging. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, people just don't learn. Well, let's move on to uh, George's next composition that the other members let him put on the album. This is going to be Piggies. You know, I mentioned different genres. This one clearly has a classical flavor, but that's partly because the lyrics are about class. Um, you know, this sort of is related to Taxman, not only in that it's about wealth and class, but also George says he wrote it circa 65, 66. So, um, you know, in the Esher demo, he uses pork chops instead of bacon. But, you know, if a pig is eating pork chops or bacon, it, it's still cannibalistic. So, uh, <laughs> interestingly, John sings on this but does not play, and it's Chris Thomas who's playing the harpsichord, none of the Beatles. Um, it was another little stroke of serendipity. Um, Scott mentioned the uh, A-Track machines being in the hall and them grabbing them. There was a uh, classical recording session being set up that had a harpsichord. And they said, oh, let's use that sucker. And then the, the, the guy said, you can't move the harpsichord. So Paul, George, Ringo, and Chris go to the instrument and record it there. Yeah, Chris told that story. Um, imagine this. Chris, Chris was, was a kid. Yeah, he's 21. 
21 years old. Jeff Emmerich says, I'm done because of all the acrimony. He got tired of, of the, all the fighting and, and basically said, I'm going out for a cigarette and never came back. Sure. So they call this. So, so George Martin calls it, or they call in Chris Thomas to come in. And then George Martin also, because he's so fed up with, with all the fighting and because he's, you know, got a family of his own. And by this point, the Beatles weren't working, you know, they weren't doing, I mean, originally the first recordings were done. They were like studio was bankers hours. Yeah. Yeah. You come in in the morning, you'd work, you'd take a lunch break, you'd come back and you'd work and you'd be done by like six o'clock at night. But at, at this point, the Beatles are finally getting to the studio about eight or nine o'clock at night and working till four or five in the morning. So George Martin decides, well, I need a break. So he goes on vacation and rather than halt the proceedings for their producer, they just say, you know what? We can do this without you. And, and they went and they continued on with Chris Thomas's producer. What I'd heard was that they'd heard Frank Sinatra like to record late at night. And they said, well, let's do that then. Good enough for Frank. Also, I think as they became more popular and more commercially successful and a little more power, they probably wanted a little revenge on all the you know white lab coats walking around them and be able to say, we're doing it our way, man. You know, the exercising oh, yeah. a little muscle as well. Of course, earlier in their career, you know, there were these, uh, I won't say wallflowers, but when, when they were first in the studio doing please, please me and that type of thing, they weren't in a position to tell anybody how to do anything. They were green and, and novices. Now they knew quite a bit about recording techniques. And, uh, you know, George Martin wasn't really the schoolmaster anymore. Yeah, he was tired of the bickering, too. But with George Martin, he had other responsibilities besides the Beatles. So 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. wasn't working for him because during the day he was also there working with the racks or other responsibilities he had around the building. So now the Sgt. Pepper album, it was noticeable how the Beatles had sort of raided the sound effects library in EMI. You know, something like <laughs> Good Morning, Good Morning, good example of that, the applause and laughter in Sgt. Pepper, etc. Well, there are some more examples of that we'll discuss as we hit them, and this is one, the pig sounds on piggies. Uh, they just had a, you know, a selection of pig sounds that they used. Also, you know, I'd mentioned that um, Chris Thomas very ably played the harpsichord part, and then um, Ringo, George, and Paul, as I said, John just sang on the track. He didn't play. They went in and played with him. Later, a string quartet was added, and uh, that would be a case where it would be appropriate because there, again, you're trying to have class and everything. But this is another situation where there's some handwritten lyrical notes from George. You know, originally he said, instead of play around in, he said play about in. It's almost the same thing. Right. He would say, you can see them having dinner. They said, you can see them out to dinner. Uh, He would say, holding forks and knives and clutching forks and knives. You can tell that as they sang it, other things have a little bit more impact. And of course, John Lennon was brilliant at that. But there is a discarded verse. And um, it goes everywhere. There's lots of piggies playing piggy pranks. You can see them on their trotters at the piggy banks, paying piggy thanks to the pig, pig brother. brother. Right. Yeah. So a take on not only big brother by calling him pig brother, but also piggy banks. George added that verse to the song uh, when he toured Japan in 1991 with Eric Clapton. Right. So clearly he was like, going, you know, if we're going to do this tune, you know, I had this other line. And yeah, exactly. And you can see them on the trotters down at the piggy banks. Paying piggy thanks to the big brother. So the next one we need to talk about is Long, Long, Long. And I would say for me, of all the tracks on the album, I think this one benefits the most from being remixed. Uh, You can just hear it more clearly. Because I did originally listen to the White Album on vinyl. Um, I discovered the Beatles uh, 77, 78-ish. You know, I heard the Blue Album, you know, the compilation, the the Red and Blue Album. So I heard Obla Dibla and some of the the White Album tracks like that before I heard the entire thing. And I did lift up the thing and flip it over to side two, three, and four. And um, yeah, long, 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 you're always running for your volume control. Um, So I think that the remix... um, was good. This is one of George's quote unquote God songs. It's not about a relationship with a with a girl, it's about a relationship with God. John is not on the track. He wasn't there. Um, and Paul and Ringo, uh, according to the book, they demonstrated a willingness to do as many takes as it required to get it just right to the degree that even even George goes, 
I think we're already there. I think we got it. And Paul and Ringo, they're feeling it. Are they just enjoying playing it or something? And uh, they wanted to keep going. I think uh, Ringo's drumming is actually very tasteful on that. That song was one of those songs that there is no middle ground with Long Long. You either love the song or you hate the song. And for years, I didn't love it. Wasn't again. Wasn't until learning how to play it live, for that for that thing I did with with Pat, um, that I grew to love it. And the remix, the remix is again. It is so crisp and clear and powerful. Ringo's playing is so nuanced. More importantly, of Ringo knowing what to play was Ringo knowing what not to play or when not to play. But the remix on this is so good. I can actually hear the tea towels. I can hear the texture of the tea towels on his drums, which is also a credit to the engineers, Ken Scott and Chris Thomas, who were miking up all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, obviously the music is brilliant, but let's give credit to the people who actually made it happen. Placing those mics and recording things so well and, and maintaining the tapes and keeping them, keeping all those sub reels, the sub mix reels and everything. It's, it's just a miracle that, that all this stuff is still there um but but yeah long 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 just the remix just knocked me out it was just one of those songs that just absolutely killed me and and again these guys were in their 20s right right i find it difficult to comprehend how these guys could be so young and so good while being that young and so wise beyond their years Yes, absolutely. Just to finish up on Long, Long, Long. I mean, it sounds like it had the same impact on you that it did on me. I just, I, I just adore that song. Yeah. Jo- all four of George's songs on this album stand out for me as as good as anything John and Paul had come up with in, in the five years, six years previously. Yeah, they were all very... I mean, even Ringo's writing songs. And, then, of course, we haven't mentioned it yet, but their um, time spent in India is uh, sort of coloring this differently than or other things they had done. Um, you know, I also made a note of Ringo's tasteful playing on this and some other ones I'll point out as we get to, just as he did on things like A Day in the Life and, you know, and th- later things where he just, as you said, knows what not to play. But what he's doing and what John Bonham used to do too is he's playing to the song. He's, he's tuned into the lyrics and, you know, he's playing the drums, not just to what the instruments are doing. And speaking of the instruments, uh, Paul is on the organ. Chris Thomas, who we've mentioned a few times, uh, is on the piano. And, of course, another thing this, this is known for, uh, there was a wine bottle on the top of the Leslie speaker. Paul hit a bass note on the organ, and it started to spin. And they said, oh, yeah, well, Mike, put a mic on that. Like you said, they mic'd everything. So, you know, when you hear that a rattly sound at the end, it was one of those happy accidents. Um, it was not intentional. To conclude with George's official canon white album content, Savoy Truffle, famously about uh, Eric Clapton again making a presence his uh, affection for particular candy and chocolate. Now, I mentioned Chris O'Dell was on the show. She was with George. Uh, the other Beatles were not there. When he did his lead vocal on Savoy Truffle, she was like, you know, uh, slipping him tea between takes. And it sounds like a band thing, and then there's horns, and there's all this energy. So sort of a late-night session doing the lead vocal it creates a different image in my mind. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about some of the ones that didn't get on, and, uh, you know, if we would have swapped any out. But... This is what he closed the album with, Savoy Truffle. What are your feelings about that song? I love it. I, 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 God, I sound like a broken record when it comes to George's material on, on this album. But as I said, George can do no wrong on this album in my book. The remix of Savoy Truffle is great because they took some of the distortion. Yeah. Because the, George deliberately wanted those horns compressed and distorted. Yeah. And he even apologized to the players. Yeah. I, I remember reading this. He goes, he goes, he goes. I felt bad because they played this gorgeous, this great part, and I had them squash it and distort it. But on the remix, the distortion's gone. The horns just breathe. The, the songs that I go back to on the White Album, George's songs never get a pass, and the and the volume always gets turned up. For yeah. them. Well, the funny thing too, you know, um, because I would sort of. You know, the most acclaimed one is While My Guitar Gently Weeps. And then, of course, you know, Biggie's maybe number two. Um, Long, Long, Long and Savoy Truffle are probably lesser known among people who aren't really... And even Piggies are sort of lesser known. I mean, it had an effect on Pink Floyd because, you know, if you listen to the Animals album, uh, you know, Pigs on the Wing and Pigs Three Different Ones definitely harkens back uh, 
you know, there's a lineage there between the Beatles and Pink Floyd, as people know. That's a whole episode unto itself. Um, yeah. <laughs> to, to stick with George, uh, The Inner Light, it's another track from this time. It didn't make it on the White Album, but it was a B-side was the, for a single. Lady Madonna B-side, yeah. So, you know, what's your feeling about The Inner Light? Very cool song. The backing track was recorded in, in India while George was working on the soundtrack to the movie Wonderwall. The only Beatle, only Beatles on Inner Light are George and Paul, and it's just Paul doing a harmony vocal. It took me a long time to really acquire a taste for George's Indian music leanings. Sure. Um, but once I did, Within You Without You and The Inner Light are just just stellar. Well, it's really a cousin to Within You Without You, isn't it? Because there's an Indian feel, and it also has the philosophical lyrics. Well, you mentioned earlier about not really hearing the White Album until the CD era. I did not hear the inner light until past masters in the eighties because this was not included on any album compilations. If you didn't have that vinyl single of lady Madonna, which I didn't cause I had that black Hey Jude album with all the leftovers. I thought the inner light was on that on the oh, Beatles no, again. It was not. That's right. The inner light was on. I think it was on the, uh, the capital rarities. Maybe so, but things like yes, it is. And, uh, the inner light and you know, my name, look up at the number. And some of these other things are just not known by the casual Beatle fans because America sort of just similar to bad boy not being released in England for quite a while There was a, a little bit of that back and forth, but um, you'll see the inner light This was one that was heard at the time that could have fit onto the white album, but um, Still saw the light of day. Well, there are three more tunes um, two of which saw the light of day in a different form um, And one of which never did uh, we'll start with not guilty uh, there again, I really didn't know about this until the Anthology 3 came out, and then you find out they did like 102 takes of the song Not Guilty. Um, let me just actually take these as a trio. Sour Milk Sea, which came out as a Jackie Lomax production, and Circles, which I had never heard myself until this set in 2018, which I found sort of like Blue Jay Way-ish. So a couple things. Now, Sour Milk Sea, cool, but maybe similar to Savoy Truffle, uh, rhythmically, I know that Leave My Kitten Alone was another completed recording that ended up not making it onto the album because they had something else that was similar to it. I'm wondering if Not Guilty, Sour Milk Sea, and Circles were victims of being similar to the stuff he already had. It was an either or, and George said, well, God, we worked our asses off on Not Guilty, but yeah, if it's between that and Well, My Guitar Jimmy, this is the type of thing we'll never know. Let's talk about one thing about regarding Not Guilty. 102 takes, yes. How many of those takes broke down after one or two notes? These were not 102 complete takes of the song. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even 102 half, you know, takes of the song halfway through. Whenever something broke down, if they stopped, it was instantly call another take. Everybody goes, 102 takes and not guilty. Oh, my God. No wonder they were sick of it. Well, you know, again, we don't know how many full takes there were. True, but I would say two things. One, I, I doubt there was 96 breakdowns. So I agree there wasn't 102 completed takes of the song. I'm sure that's not the case. But the point I was making was they clearly spent a lot of time on it and they oh, absolutely. It's, pretty, it's pretty much yeah. done. So you got to wonder why some of the other sort of flimsier stuff we'll get to later makes it on the album and this sort of beautiful, fully realized song doesn't. I doubt it's because John and Paul figured out it was a diss on them and they said, oh, you're not putting a track on here. It's a diss on <laughs> and, You know, you have all these different theories. I guess we'll never really know. But as I mentioned, this saw the light of day later because George just and did another version of it on a solo album. The 1979 self-titled solo, yeah. You know, here's what I want to see. How about an all-George side? How about side three is all George? Lennon and McCartney wouldn't <laughs> like it, but he had the material. It was warranted, I think. Our friends Richard Buskin and Eric Taros covered that on one of their Swinging Through the 60s episodes. They talked about what would a George Harrison White album look like. Right, but I'm just saying is in the context of what they actually released... They were not generous enough to do it, but, and there again, do you really want to hear George sing, you know, eight songs in a row? Maybe it's kind of cool that they keep mixing it up. Now here's Ringo, now here's Paul, now here's John. I mean, that's kind of cool too. What I'm saying is they could have gave him five or six. They didn't have to give him four. They have to go, well, George, you know, your quota is one per, now Ringo, you only get one usually, but hey, we're going to give you two, you lucky guy. But you look at it, it, it follows the formula of every, of every Beatles album up to that point. True. Ringo gets one song per album. George gets one song per side, right? you know, and John and Paul split the rest. It, it's That's how it was. Not Guilty could have made the final album, just like I think only a Northern song should have made Pepper. But what I think is that in the beginning, the reason George and, and uh, 
Ringo got one song is because the band knew that Ringo was popular. He had his fans, and they wanted to have sort of a token song for the Ringo fans, a token song for the George fans. What I'm saying is by this point, they had to acknowledge George's emerging talent as a writer. For him still the beginning four out of 30 by the time of the White Album, I can kind of see why George was frustrated. Oh, I can absolutely see why George was frustrated. And and yeah, that was a that was a big part of the acrimony that, that we hear about. But his biggest frustration, this is my take on it, and I could be wrong, and I'm sure other Beatle people will will tell me I'm out of my mind. George always, always looked up to John as a big brother. Yeah. Always wanted to impress John, always wanted John's approval. And George is now writing these great songs. And John still doesn't give a damn. John could barely be bothered to contribute on the George stuff. And he felt like he was being slighted. You know, John didn't want to give up the real estate. I mean, he and Paul were prolific at this point, and they were ambitious. And it was probably a matter of, oh, it's a George too, and I don't need to show up for that. I'll stay home and watch TV. That is disrespectful for sure. It, yeah, and, and, and you can see why that, that upset George. And I have to bring up, what happened in January 69, the big fight that we see in the movie Let It Be, where where George and Paul are fighting, and George, and this is George is like, he goes, look, I'll play whatever it is you want me to play, and if you don't want me to play, I won't play at all. Whatever it is that'll please you, that's what I'll do. And everybody, uh, I, mean, I think Richard Buskin and I have, have disagreed about this, and he, he definitely thinks George is angry at Paul. I think George is so frustrated with John's lack of interest on any of his stuff, plus having Paul go, nah, I don't think I want you to do that on, on, on my songs. I think it all came to a head, but I think most of George's frustration was with John. Mm-hmm. I might be wrong, and I'm sure people will tell me if I am, and I hope they do. But again, as much as I love a lot of John's stuff on the White Album, if you, if you, if you picked a John song and a George song from the White Album and asked me which one I'd prefer – more often than not, I'd probably pick the George song. 